so hard to believe, but we're at the uh, end of uh, this semester anyway. Um, so we are going to just finish up the last two chapters. There were two chapters remaining. Um, and they are not two very complicated or ton of new material kind of chapters, so that's good news. Chapter 53, chapter 54, and then I, you know, I need to get a new uh, dry erase because I noticed that what I write on the board is barely legible uh, because the pen is almost out of ink. So again, today we're covering the last two chapters. We'll do a review. Just as a reminder, next Saturday falls within the reading period, so that's time for you to prepare for your exams. We don't have a class next week. And then our final is scheduled for the week after, Saturday, December 19th. I know I've sent an email to make sure that you realize that and make sure that, again, it's not in my control, but for whatever reason, they schedule the final exam to start half hour before a class typically starts. So the final exam starts at 8.30. That doesn't make me very happy either. I'm sure it doesn't make most of you very happy. Uh, so please try to do your best to get here on time. Not the hugest issue, but if you can, uh, remember that it starts then. And then, um, I'm sure you got my email a couple of days ago that there is a study outline that's been posted on Blackboard that should help as a guide. Uh, but we'll talk more about the exam. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is go through these two chapters, then take a break, and then uh, do our final uh, review. Questions? All right, let's get started. So the family law chapter comes uh, after the chapter that we did um, on wills and estates, and it sort of follows, uh, and even the chapters that we did on property, personal property and real property, because remember, we're talking about how property is uh, transferred legally uh, from one person to another, uh, and one of the ways that that is done, uh, we saw was perhaps when someone passes away, either through their will, or through a trust arrangement, or even if someone passes away without a will, that there are state laws called intestacy statutes under which property has a sort of um, you know, in, in terms of hierarchy, in terms of how it passes uh, to lineal uh, descendants. So, you know, we're talking about family law here, but you know, property law comes in because we're going to talk about, unfortunately, we're going to talk about, you know, when marriages are terminated, right? How are property between a married couple uh, distributed? So that, you know, so again, a lot of these concepts sort of come together. So anyway, let's talk about marriage because Saturday morning. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is a chapter of family law. So before we get to marriage, let's talk a little bit about some of the case law or some of the issues relating to pre-marriage uh, issues. Uh, so a promise to marry, okay, uh, happens when one person proposes to another person, sort of like makes it sound like totally like a contract, doesn't it? A promise of marriage proposed to one person where the other person has accepted it, and then, perhaps one party changes their mind. And this, you know, this has become a fairly settled area of the law, but there used to be some interesting case law. Because what if there were gifts that were given to one another or arrangements that were made between a couple in anticipation of marriage, um, but, you know, for whatever reason, one party or both parties decide to call it off. And then the question is, well, what happens? Um, you know, what are the expectations on each side? And more importantly, what are the legal obligations with respect to property? And we all know what an engagement is. I mean, it doesn't have to be, a, you know, a, a formal thing. But again, it's an understanding that there's a period within which two parties have committed uh, to be married and, you know, and then they would uh, get married. Uh, and some of the issues relating to a broken engagement. Right? So case law, years ago, in some states, was based on a fault rule. Imagine fault with respect to personal issues and how difficult that would be to prove. But some states sort of followed this rule, which basically said, look, uh, and here we're talking about engagement rings, but you could even be talking about other property being transferred from one person to another uh, in contemplation or in anticipation of marriage. So under the fault rule, if the person who gave the engagement ring breaks off the engagement, let's typically say it's a guy, right? The other side gets to keep the engagement ring. Well, that's a nice windfall, right? Uh, but, but again, how subjective is that, right? So imagine, under the fall rule, if a guy gave a ring to his fiance uh, and then broke off the engagement because, quote unquote, it was his fault, um, then she gets to keep the ring. But if the person who accepted an engagement ring breaks off the engagement, so you know, turn the tables a little bit, then that person has to return the ring. That was 
the state of case law, common law, uh, totally and completely unworkable, right? In, in many ways, many of us would argue a waste of judicial time, uh, quite frankly, because couldn't we come up with a better uh, rule? And in fact, we have. So the objective rule now is, look, if a gift, most notably an engagement ring was given uh, in anticipation, of course, of marriage, so then if that engagement is called off, case law says, you gotta return the ring. It doesn't matter whose fault it is, it doesn't matter who called it off. Uh, but I would say that this rule applies perhaps to maybe other things. If, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's a, it's a necklace, maybe whatever the case might be. But if it is a gift of personal property that was given as a token um, for a, an eventual marriage, then regardless of why that marriage is not going to take place, if, you know, uh, that marriage is broken off, case law would now say, and the objective rule would now say, that there is a legal requirement to give it back. Now, of course, if the other party doesn't want it back, that's fine, but legally there is a responsibility uh, to return that. Okay. All right, family law, so let's first talk about marriage. What is marriage? Well, some of you talked about how, just a couple of weeks ago during our assignments, how this is one of the issues that has sort of evolved over time. Uh, but marriage is indeed, you know, a legal union between spouses. And when I sort of read the legal definition, it kind of reminds me of contract law again in many ways, right? Legal union between spouses that confers, which means to give, of certain legal rights and duties upon the spouses and upon the children born of that marriage. So when I read rights and duties, voluntary agreements, so you know, yeah, I mean, it is pretty much an agreement. And although this is not subject to contract law, you can see a lot of parallels. There are rights and responsibilities of, uh, for, you know, for with respect to each of the parties, and if there are children born in that marriage, we see that that brings uh, a set of issues as well. So, you know, any new area of the law, we sort of try to remind ourselves, well, is this federal law, is this state law? And, you know, it's kind of both, I, I wanna say, because states still determine um, what are the legal requirements to get married. So for example, um, you know, these, state, these, these, these slides have just become outdated since June, because the first bullet actually was something that states used to have a say in, which was, well, if a state decides that a union can only be between uh, people of the opposite gender, then that was something that a large number of states had done. Well, we see that yes, states do get to say some things about mar marital requirements, however, they don't get to say the first one. Why? Because the fe federal uh, Supreme Court just ruled finally, definitively, that um, it violates the Constitution uh, to say that. So it can be people of the same gender as well. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, not just with this area, but in many areas of the law, how we're sort of living through history almost, right? So, yeah, states have no longer the ability to say that, but states still have the ability to say how old uh, parties have to be. And there is some legal differences between states because you know, you might just think that the across the uh, board rule is 18, and that's typically true, but some states may have a 16, 17 rule with, with parental permission, and so on, so states have a little bit of, and then they can kind of determine what kind of license do you need, how much fee do you need to pay, where do you go to apply for that license, so that kind of sort of bureau, bureaucratic administrative part of it is governed. Uh, by state law. So there are both state and federal requirements we see with respect to what it means uh, to be a married couple or to apply for uh, marriage. You know, and, and again, if a state has this rule that you know you can get married if you're what, 17 or something like that, uh, but you need parental consent, right? Your parents have to agree to it. Well, remember we talked about the concept of emancipation which is where a child has legally um, separated themselves from their parents because of whatever reason, whatever reason that the court or the law deemed fit, uh, because they're taking care of themselves, because there might be some fraud issues, whatever the case might be. Uh, in that case, parental consent is not needed. Okay. Need a license to get married, right? 
right? Uh, you know, a, a ceremony that is just done, um, you know, let's say a religious ceremony or something like that might be very meaningful, but it's not a legally recognizable uh, union. So a marriage license is, a, again, a bureaucratic administrative process, and it's, you know, you gotta look at state law, but it's, you know, it's a few dollars, and it's obtained at the county clerk's office, okay. Uh, that's, that's typically what we think about uh, as a marriage, except that some states um, issue marriage licenses, but also recognize uh, common law marriages. And you might say, well, what are common law marriages? Well, common law marriages are marriages that are recognized in a handful of states. I want to say 10, 12 states in the country, California, some of the western states um, uh, being sort of examples of that. Um, a common law marriage is that even when a marriage license has not been issued, um, the law will recognize a marriage um, if there are certain requirements that are met. For example, parties are eligible for marriage. So, you know, today, even a couple living as a same sex couple could have a common law marriage. Uh, but more importantly, it has to be people of a certain age, right? I mean, two 15 year olds cannot be said to be legally married because, again, you have to sort of be that state at the age of 18. So, otherwise eligible to marriage, uh, to marry. Parties voluntarily, and I want to sort of, you know, fix this, intend to be spouses, right? Because it doesn't have to be people of opposite gender. Parties live together, and they hold themselves out as husband. I can't even say that anymore. Hold themselves out as spouses, right? So this is where, you know, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It is a duck. Right? And this often comes up where people have been in very long-term relationships, never quite took the plunge, if you will, uh, to get that marriage license, but, but heck, I mean, you know, did everything, sort of what married couples do, maybe had a child, maybe didn't have a child, uh, but, you know, had shared finances, lived together, held themselves out to be a couple. You know, this comes up with what happens when that relationship ends. You know, if you call it a common law marriage, then we'll see that there could be a divorce, there could be a proper division of property, uh, and so on. So common law marriages are recognized, as I said, and you know, it's sort of the Hollywood thing, right? You think about like famous Hollywood couples that sort of say, no, they're not, not getting married, but when, you know, you've been with the same person for 20 years. Well, that's common law marriage. And you know, I don't mean to say that 20 years is sort of the, you know, the bright line rule, but it's a number of years. You can't be in a six month relationship and be in a common law marriage. But you know, if it starts to sort of be, become a meaningful period of time and so on, the law will recognize a union that just technically didn't have a piece of paper that's on the line. All right, slide is somewhat outdated course and the case is somewhat outdated but it's still instructive because as we learned um, that um, you know it was decades long battle um, uh, to uh, on the part of same sex and same gender couples uh, to ask that their union be legally recognized it started with domestic partnership laws uh, it started with civil union laws uh, in various states uh, and so on and then it evolved as you know you guys know and you sort of uh, presented on this topic and also uh, listened to this topic in the, uh, never say the name of the case, well, a Bergefell uh, decision, where the Supreme Court has now said that uh, same-sex marriages are as valid for, again, protections under fe federal and state law as any other uh, marriage would be. And this, the, this case that was in the book, which I'll do quickly, is an example of the kinds of battles that were happening um, at the state level, uh, because you know you had same-sex couples suing, um, and this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of New Mexico in 2013, where again a same-sex couple is saying that okay, you know we're not taking this battle. The Supreme Court hasn't sort of decided on this issue at the federal level yet, but we're going to say, look, our state has a constitution, and that state constitution guarantees each of its citizens equal protection under the law, and we're going to say that. The fact that we don't have the same health insurance rights and the same rights with respect to taxes and benefits and that sort of thing, um, that that violates equal protection. And you know, a lot of the state courts agree with the plaintiffs in this case. And for example, New Mexico said the same thing and said, yeah, it violates the New Mexico state constitution. Um, some states had adopted uh, you know, legislation that validated uh, same-sex mar marriages. And other states, as you know, had bans. But ultimately, again, all of this is not historical because 
once, you know, remember precedent, right? Remember, you know, just because a marriage is recognized in the you know, state of New Mexico uh, it, starting in 2013 doesn't mean that it was recognized in the state of Ohio, for example, right? Which didn't recognize it. So, you know, and also didn't mean that federal benefits uh, could come. You still had to pay federal taxes. This is just state law. So now all of that has changed. So sorry that some of these slides have not been updated yet, but you know, it's all fresh in our minds. Okay. So marriages result in two people becoming parents, right? And again, I will stress that um, you know, if children are not just in marriages of uh, you know, a husband and wife, the children can be in marriages of same-sex couples. So, you know, although we may not say it every single time, these issues now apply to every married couple. So, what are parental responsibilities with respect to uh, their children? And we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about, remember, with um, contract law and minors and so on. Uh, so parents have an obligation, a legal obligation, for which they could be charged if they don't provide uh, uh, support for their children, food, shelter, clothing, medical care, and other necessities of life, right? I mean, we, we know that. Uh, and it's not something that you know, the law constantly have to, it has to intervene on, but it is a legal requirement. Until when? Until the child reaches the age of majority, which is the age of 18, or a child becomes legally emancipated is again the process by which uh, someone absolutely separates themselves from having authority by their parents. And we know, maybe we didn't like it when we were 16 or 17 years old, parents have the right to control the behavior of their children. Good luck with that one. Uh, but again, because there's a responsibility, because if a child commits a tort, a parent could be responsible. You know, if you let your 15-year-old get behind the wheel of a car and say, go oh, pick up the milk, you know, you're old enough, well, that's going to have uh, consequences because, again, that, that child really is not legally um, eligible to drive a vehicle. And if that child causes damage and injury and so on, the parents are responsible because, again, it is assumed parents have responsibility over their children until age 18. And sadly, you know, too many cases of this, we see uh, parental failure to provide um, uh, the necessities of life could lead to charges of child neglect and, you know, uh, involve the state stepping in uh, to, to sort of address that situation. All right, marching on real quickly. Now we know the ma marriage requirements. Some marriages don't last forever, despite the promises made and despite uh, good intentions to start off. Um, so what are ways in which a marriage, again, if we're gonna think about it in terms of being a legal agreement, um, well, you know, it entangles uh, people not just emotionally, but entangles people legally through property that is jointly owned, or even if it's not jointly owned, how do you split it up? And not just property, but debts, right? Sometimes you owe more than you actually own. Well, how are creditors gonna get paid, right? All of this is a sadly legal process. So the first question to ask is, how is the marriage ending? Is the marriage ending through an annulment? or is the marriage ending through a divorce? So what is an annulment? Well, an annulment is a legal declaration that basically says, an order of the court that says, we're gonna treat this as if the marriage never happened. As if it, it just does, didn't even exist, okay? That technically is an annulment. And you might say, well, I mean, there were witnesses, there were people, how could you say this was just our imagination? Well, there are sort of very, very strict grounds on which an illegal annulment, remember there are also religious annulments, right? I mean, for example, the Catholic Church may not allow a remarriage unless the first marriage is annulled, right? So there are sort of those religious components of an annulment, but the legal components of an annulment are, number one, one of the parties was a minor, and it was required under state law that that party have parental consent, but some justice of the peace or whatever still performed the marriage ceremony. Well, you know, if you didn't meet the legal requirements for being married, then that marriage could very easily be annulled. One of the parties was mentally incapacitated at the time of marriage. Now think back to that chapter on contract law. Remember, if you are not someone that has the ability uh, to appreciate what it means to enter into a legally binding contract, 
then you also don't have the ability to really understand what it means to be in a legally recognizable marriage. And you sort of see it played out again. One of the parties was intoxicated at the time of marriage. And this always makes me think of Hollywood. And it makes me think about the Britney Spears debacle from years ago. And you might say, you know, people go to Vegas and do these crazy things and then go and get a crazy annulment and so on. But it is, you know, it's not that unheard of, right? A marriage was never consummated, all right, fine. You know, I mean, I don't think a court is going to require proof of that, but there might be some issue around that. Uh, potentially physical abuse occurred during the marriage. It was a short-term marriage. And these are now, one of the parties is an alcoholic. There was bigamy, meaning, uh, you know, someone's married more than once, and that's something that we don't uh, uh, recognize. It was duress or fraud leading to the marriage. I mean, doesn't this, a lot of this sound like contract law? You know, if you don't understand or if you were duped into it, well, then why should you be forced into being in a contract, right? Same thing, you know? If, if, if your understanding of what it is that you were doing wasn't clear to you, then the marriage itself should be legally annulled. And the reason that it, an annulment may be preferable to a divorce, other than the stigma, perhaps, of, 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 of being a divorcee, uh, is the fact that the legal entanglements, property divisions and so on, are not as complicated in an annulment uh, than they would be under a divorce. But most marriages do it uh, or terminate, uh, not by an annulment, but by a, a divorce, right? Um, and what is a divorce? Well, I mean, it, you know, to enter into a marriage, you need a license and so on, and the formality, unless it's a common law marriage. Well, to end it, you need some official word of the law, and that is, of course, an order of the court via a divorce proceeding that essentially terminates uh, that legal union, because that's what it is. And again, states sort of have this dichotomy where some states required um, that there be fault before uh, marriage uh, should, you know, could be could be uh, uh, terminated uh, to show that somebody was doing something uh, that amounted to such a degree that those parties should not be married anymore. That's the fault, of course. But but again, you know, over time we evolve, and we say that's just you know just like you shouldn't be able to force two people to work together under contract. You should be able to force people. The law should be forcing people to be together if they, one of them doesn't want to be together regardless of fault. So these days we sort of see a lot of divorce proceedings that are no fault divorces, not blaming anyone, but citing irreconcilable differences. Right? That's sort of the buzzword, isn't it? Um, and that captures a lot of things. Um, and that essentially has become what divorce is based on. They are really not based on some judicial body trying to figure out who's at fault, right? Because that really is not where we are. So again, the buzzword here is irreconcilable differences, meaning we're not compatible. Uh, or we don't have to explain ourselves to you. <laughs> we just don't want to be in this marriage anymore. So let's go through the legal process. Um, so, you know, you think about how a lawsuit starts, right? If you're going to um, sue another party for, for example, breach of contract or something like that. You have to go to court. Remember, you have to file a complaint. The defendant has to answer the complaint. There may be cross complaints, blah, 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 and depositions and so on. Well, anytime you go to court, uh, that's the legal framework under which a civil case will, will, will move, right? So even a divorce starts with one party filing a legal document a petition uh, for divorce that starts uh, the proceeding. And sadly, um, the other party has to respond. And if they cannot work out their differences, the parties will go to court. Uh, and they're going to go to court not just to dissolve the marriage, because if you're going to say, well, if it's a no-fault divorce, why do we need to hash this out? Well, remember, there are, you know, there is property to divide. There is, um, there are children. There are custody issues, and so on. And you know, hopefully vast majority of cases don't have to go to that level, but you know, think about it. This is a, you know, if you think a plaintiff and a defendant in a breach of contract uh, case have animosity toward them, uh, toward each other, you know, there are human emotions involved here and sometimes, you know, things do go uh, quite that far. Uh, some uh, 
states and you know have a longer waiting period, others have a shorter wearing, uh, waiting period, um, can't just file a petition uh, and get a divorce very, very quickly. There has to be some waiting period. Clear your heads. Was this something you know that you really thought through and so on? So courts are not going to say a petition filed at 9 a.m. is going to get a decree of divorce at noon, right? There is a certain amount of cooling off period uh, within which sometimes parties do change their mind. I know. Just to see how many. Uh, Say that again. Do you know the statistics? How many couples change their mind? Oh my God! You're asking me a tough question there. Um, yeah, just two. You know, I, I think it's anecdotal. I don't even think the statistics are kept. Quite honestly, I would be very surprised if they are. Uh, but we know anecdotally it does happen, uh, right? But sadly, it often means two years later you're <laughs> on the same path. Uh, uh, but uh, but yeah, these are personal issues. Uh, you know that require a lot of thought and, and consideration uh, in particular. Well, um, sadly, um, some situations also involve uh, the fear or the threat of physical force by one party against the other. So a lot of, by the way, divorces, custody issues, and a lot of these issues are decided by what kind of court? Think back to the earlier chapters. Federal court or state court? Absolutely. And special limited jurisdiction court or general jurisdiction court? Limited, limited jurisdiction because there are family courts. Okay. So in a way, it's sort of a blessing to know that the same court that decides intellectual property disputes is not a case that's hearing family law. They're very specialized judges and so on, and lawyers that really exclusively practice in this area. Um, so you know, there, there's a lot of sort of um, you know, this is what the court does. And sometimes, you know, you file a petition for divorce and you also at the same time file for a restraining order, which is almost sort of criminal, right? In its, in its, you know, in its effect, because what it's basically saying is that one party, you know, has a restraining order against the other party, which means that that other party cannot come within whatever, 100 feet of that party. I mean, if they do, they could be arrested, right? Because again, you can legitimately prove that either there's harassment or there is the potential for physical harm. So, you know, family court issues are not just divide up the property, decide on custody issues. It could involve uh, things of a potential criminal nature. Uh, there are, there's no requirement that a party to a divorce have a lawyer. Um, you know, so there are what's referred to as a pro se uh, divorce. And the word pro se, by the way, not on the exam, but the word pro se, anytime you sort of see it, it just means that someone is representing themselves, okay? They're not choosing to hire a lawyer. So that just doesn't happen in a divorce situation. It could be when you're sued or when you're charged with a criminal, you know, not probably the best idea in a criminal trial to represent yourself. And I don't care if you're like the smartest lawyer, you're, you're not going to be objective when it comes to yourself, right? But in a divorce, a lot of parties would say, I don't need a lawyer. This is an amicable divorce, meaning we're all grown ups here. There's very little to sort of argue about. We've just made a rational decision that this doesn't make sense anymore. And perhaps then it's okay to not you know, make the lawyers rich and kind of handle this yourself. It's not that difficult if you're not arguing over the nitty gritty. So yeah, some in some divorce settlements, parties do represent each other. And what's become really, really common is you reach your own settlement agreement. Maybe you go to a mediator. Remember we talked about all those alternative dispute resolutions? And you know, I mean, that, that's kind of where, you know, okay, we'll represent ourselves and we're not gonna need lawyers, we're not gonna go through arbitration. However, I don't, we don't understand the law. What are our legal rights and so on? And can we just get a neutral third party to explain those things to us? And you know, once we go through you know four or five sessions, then we can come up with a settlement agreement because the court, in order to grant a divorce, needs to see something. What have you decided with respect to the termination of this marriage? Because there are issues with respect to property and debt and children, if there are any, and what if there was a prenuptial agreement and so on, how are we resolving all of this? But this is, you know, in terms of, you know, you asked me Yuli about statistics, uh, well, again, I don't have a solid statistic, but I will say that in the modern era today, uh, most marriages that are terminated by divorce involve mediation and a settlement. 
And I think that's good news, essentially, because A, it's good emotionally, and B, it's just good because we're you know, not wasting the court's valuable time on what are essentially personal matters that should be resolved among the parties themselves. So I men mentioned uh, prenuptial agreements. Think back to when we were doing statute of frauds. Remember, I gave the example of my legs and the M in my legs stood for marriage and we said those are certain contracts that have to be in writing and you know, contracts involving marriage and what could those possibly be? Well, here they are. Prenuptial agreements or even possibly post-nuptial. What are nuptials? You know, you get married. Pre coming before marriage, post coming after. So what is a prenuptial agreement? Well, now we're actually really talking about a legal contract. Right? It's a contract, an agreement that is entered into before marriage that basically will decide how, if, and when the marriage ends, whether it's through divorce, annulment, or even the death of one of the parties, how property, or potentially even how the children that may not even exist at the time of marriage uh, may be accounted for after the marriage. Right? So, you know, are, th are those very popular, do you think? Again, I don't have the actual statistics, but yeah, they're becoming more popular. Um, but what, when do you think prenuptial agreements are used more often than not? When, in what kinds of situations do they make sense? One of the spouses is more rebellious than Yeah, that's one. So one spouse could just come into the marriage as being quite a bit more wealthier than the other spouse, sure. Another along the same lines could be one spouse may not be wealthy today, but given their professional degree, um, has the potential to do a heck of a lot better. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, a, you know, a physician, a, a surgeon marrying uh, an artist, right? I'm not saying anything about the artist, but you know, I'm just looking at the potential, earning potential. The artist could be very fulfilled and lead a very happy life, but maybe sell two paintings during their lifetime. Uh, whereas the surgeon could be miserable working 80 hours a week, but make a ton of money. And in the end, if the marriage ends, you know, it's possible that the parties want to enter into a, a prenuptial agreement, and I bet you it won't be the artist suggesting it. It'll potentially be the other. So yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's sort of very anti-romantic, to say we're going to spend the rest of our life together, and then on the other hand, by the way, here's a six-page agreement uh, that basically spells out what would happen if we are not happily ever after, right? But on the other hand, if you think rationally about it, you know, uh, probably is a better idea to, uh, you know, sort of the liquidated damages, right, where parties enter into a contract and say, look, if one of us breaches, we've already agreed what uh, the level of damages will be. So prenuptial agreement is kind of like that. Um, yes, they're becoming more popular, but no, they are still not the norm, right? Most people do not get married and also sign a prenuptial agreement. By the way, possible to have postnuptial agreement. Those are rare because that is a contract that the parties enter into during the marriage that say, oh, oops, you know, we're so busy planning the wedding that we forgot the prenuptial agreement. Well, five years in, why don't we write up, what, write one up now? Possible, uh, but if you, to me, you've lost the leverage, right? I mean, you know, what, in, what incentive does the less wealthy party have to sign it at this point, right? But again, you could be very rational and say, you know what, you never know, probably is a good idea. I don't want to be enemies afterwards. Not that I think it's going to happen, but sure, I'm willing to do it. So again, it's legal. It's a legal vehicle that is available. All right, now let's get into the nitty gritty. Um, you know, whether it's through a, um, a settlement agreement that you reach with a mediator or whether a court is deciding on um, uh, the, the divorce uh, decree, there is going to have to be a division of assets and a division of debts, right? And the way that that is handled, and we don't have to know all the mechanics of this because we would need to spend a good amount of time understanding these rules, but the big concepts to keep in mind are you have to look at separate property and marital property, right? You know, Coming back to statistics, because you asked me a question. This I know. People are getting married later and later and later, right? Used to be that if you were 23 years old, well, why aren't you married already? You know, today, people are getting married well into their 30s, 40s, and so on. 
So the point I'm making here is that people will come into a marriage with their own wealth, their own property. They may already own a house. They may already own a vacation property and so on. So, you know, to the extent that you're looking at a divorce situation 10 years later, the court's going to look to see, well, what is, you know, in this sort of marital estate is what it's called, right? If you're going to look at people that were married for 10 years, 15 years, or whatever, how much marital property are we talking about and how much separate property are we talking about, right? What is separate property? Property that is owned by a spouse before their marriage, and this could be inheritances, gifts received by a spouse, even during the marriage. So, you know, if, if, if husband and wife are married and wife gets a $50,000 inheritance from her aunt who passes away, well, that doesn't become marital property, right? The aunt left that to just the wife. That is, her, uh, sorry, separate property, even though it didn't come to her until, you know, she actually got married. So, there's separate property. What's marital property? Marital property is everything that was quote unquote acquired during the course of marriage. Your bank accounts, your you know, your uh, your your retirement accounts even. Your you know, you may have an individual IRA, but it's not so individual if it was acquired during marriage. So any income earned, any property that's owned, real property, personal property, separate property that has been converted to marital property. Well that could happen. You owned a house before marriage. But after marriage, you say, hey, I want my spouse to be on this. I want to make this a tenancy by the entirety. Uh, you know, I, I, more importantly, I want my spouse to be on the mortgage, right? I mean, I'm not paying the, you know, I've got this. Well, I mean, look, I'm not joking around. I mean, these are just things normal, everyday people do. So yeah, you could have owned that home as a, uh, you know, one owner, but converted it to a, you know, and it doesn't matter that that party had paid the down payment and that party had made mortgage payments for the first 10 years, once that spouse is added, you've turned the whole thing into marital property. So, the court, when it is going to divide the property, or the parties that are going to reach a settlement agreement by themselves, are going to be guided by how property should be divided based on the state that they live in. I'll take a break here for those questions. Sorry. That's okay. uh, so, so then, in case if the house is old, like legally old, by all uh, the uh, but only one of the spouse, right? But they, they, they both pay for the mortgage. So well, are you so telling me that, okay, so let me just understand this. So the facts are that uh, one party just bought the house. Yeah. The other party's name is not on the deed. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, that means the mortgage is really legally owned by just one party. But, but on the other hand, what you're saying is, and I can just fill in the facts a little bit to just make it interesting, but even if that is the case, the other party is still paying the mortgage. I mean, the, the name may not be on it, but they're writing a check because whatever, we just never got around to changing it. And what you're saying is if 15 years later, 20 years later, the couple divorces, does that mean that the uh, um, other spouse gets nothing? No, probably not. You can't sort of hide behind the fact that we never got around to changing the deed or mortgage, but it is clear that the other spouse contributed, you know, through their earnings and so on and so forth, lived in the house, made the, you know, whatever. So I don't, I don't think that's good enough, if, if that was your question. Yeah, because it is very much, you know, based on reality as well, not just the legal fiction. Um, so, uh, how is property divided? You know, what are the principles? Look, you can, whatever the law says, parties can do whatever they want on their own as well, right? We saw that with prenuptial agreements. You can decide on your own. And same thing, if we're going to reach a settlement agreement, you know, two parties, they can say what, a, it doesn't matter what the law says. One party can say, look, I don't want anything. Right? I'm going to go live in an island and going to be a bohemian and I kept, I couldn't care less about all of this wealth. Well, you know, they're willing to sign that and move on. That's fine. No, no, no law is going to say, no, 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 it has to be equitable distribution. Right? But I don't know too many people that don't want what is legally fair and what is legally, what they're legally entitled to. So even if you're going through mediation, you're going to say, look, what, what would a court do? And a mediator, often a lawyer, will say, look, our state is an equitable distribution state. 
by the way, New Jersey, New York, most cases, most most uh, states that don't recognize common law marriages go with equitable distribution. And equitable, by the way, the word equity, equity means fair. Equity doesn't mean 50-50. But, uh, but, you know, so yeah, court orders a fair distribution of marital property. Doesn't mean equal. But the problem is the longer the marriage, the court's not going to nickel and dime this, right? I mean, you know, it's a 15-year marriage, it's a 20-year marriage. I mean, at some point, they're not going to, you know, no court wants to hear, but I paid this and you did that or whatever. You know, it's pretty much going to try to be down the middle or try to be equitable. But they look at other things as well. Well, if you are talking about a surgeon and a artist, you know, and there's no prenuptial agreement, when you're talking about kids and you're talking about whatever, you know, there is an expectation that, you know, just because you didn't, or a homemaker, just because you didn't go out and quote unquote bring in a paycheck, doesn't mean that there are not other things in a marriage that are equally valuable, right? So it's not just based on who brought in the paycheck, the length of the marriage, uh, raising a family. Um, you know, the income potential of one party versus the other. Uh, was someone sick? You know, is there a disability? Uh, is there an age difference between the two, between the two, on and on and on, right? So you look at all of these factors. Um, and a mediator will help sort of say that, you know, it doesn't mean that if everything, you know, if you're going to divide up the house, you have to sell the house. Most parties say, look, you know what, one party can stay there. And we'll just take a little bit more of the bank account. Right? But you've got to figure out a fair and equitable way based on the amount of the marriage. The marriage is, you know, six months long. It's not an annulment, then we're not talking about splitting things up this way. Right? So again, it is very much factually dependent. And what the couple wants to do and how much they want to drag this out. Right? But if you happen to live in a state that recognizes community property, well then it's very simple. Okay? The law says, regardless of what you may or may not agree to on your own, that's your business, but the law says separate property goes to, goes to whoever it belongs to, marital property gets divided down the middle. 50-50, right? So in a way that's easier, uh, that's the legal, you know, that's how California does it, for example, but you know, New Jersey has a slightly different rule of equity, uh, which is much more look at the facts and circumstances. The marital property does not just go. Oh, I love the next case because it is just such a, such a, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's a 2006 case, Court of Appeal of Texas. Um, we're talking about $2 million in a lottery ticket. What happened? You were laughing. You know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> so um, the two people who were going through the divorce, and they, they had, I think, three mediations, and um, they came to an agreement. They signed it off, the, the lawyer signed it off, and the judge said, you know, your divorce is granted. The, fo the following day, um, the guy wins a lottery ticket for $2 million, and the judge actually hadn't signed it, but you know, verbally said that their divorce right. is granted, so she tried to uh, appeal and say that she was part of the money. I deserve a million of that $2 million. <laughs> And what does the Court of Appeals of Texas say? No, they let me keep going. Absolutely. Because the point here was, which said, well, no, we're still legally married. I don't see a divorce decree being signed. The court said, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, yes, I mean, you're not divorced until the marriage is legally terminated. So technically, the dollar that was used to buy the, the, the uh, lottery ticket was marital property. And if it resulted in a $2 million you know, lottery ticket, then yes. It but on the other hand, here the facts clearly establish, thank goodness for him, uh, that that there was just an administrative act. I mean, it was not, you know the divorce was done and it's legally done when every they've signed off. Uh, you know, it was just a last piece of thing left. So yeah, absolutely, there was you know because this, uh, Texas is a community property state. So if you're going to follow community property, you know this was after the first meeting of the mediation. Boy, and nothing, this would have been a completely different result, so it's a good, so I don't know what, the, you can draw your own lessons from all of this in terms of the timing of buying a lottery ticket, but uh, but this was just, you know, just such a funny case that you, you just, 
you just need it in a textbook to kind of highlight this point. All right, remember I said that when marriages end, it's not just dividing up the property, it's also dividing up the debt, right? I mean, you know, we always sort of think about, you know, money, but, you know, or assets, but sometimes liabilities exceed the assets. So, um, you know, in terms of, well, you know, we live in a very credit-oriented uh, society, right? So how do you, who's, you know, if you're a married couple, who's responsible? How much are you responsible for your spouse's lack of discipline and spending, right? Well, the law says that, look, each spouse is personally liable for their own pre-marital debt. So if you came in with a $50,000 credit card debt, okay, that's yours. You can't get married and say, all right, I've just, you know, uh, passed off $25,000 to someone else. That's not going to happen. That's kind of like separate property. Uh, but about debts that are incurred during the course of the marriage. And here it gets a little funny because joint marital debts that are incurred for joint needs, meaning running a household, buying a family car, all of those things are joint debts, right? So court will equally distribute those debts. A tax bill, right? Property tax, you know, income tax is always jointly. Uh, you know, if, if couples are filing a joint uh, tax return, they're jointly liable. It doesn't matter. If their back taxes due and they get divorced, they are, they are both, of, both parties are liable. But look at joint debts incurred during the marriage for joint <coughs> needs. Needs, right? So what if one spouse goes out there and buys, you know, has a midlife crisis and goes out and buys a Maserati, you know? And, and the other spouse has no desire to drive that or whatever, but buys it with their, you know, a joint bank account or whatever, and then they get a divorce and there's, you know, $40,000 owing in that car. The court's going to say, well, wait a minute, that's not, you know, a need of the marriage. I mean, that kind of a debt shouldn't come to uh, the other party. And if you're smart, you will likely have sort of worked that out in your uh, uh, settlement, settlement agreement to begin with because those are the kinds of things that people sometimes fight about. The law would be on the side of uh, the spouse that did not have the midlife crisis there, right? Because even though, yeah, it's a joint debt, meaning that it was a debt incurred during marriage, but it wasn't for a necessity. It was for someone who just, whatever, decided that they didn't want to drive a mini minivan anymore, and they wanted to have a sports car, and the sports car was whatever, $70,000, you know? That shouldn't be the kind of debt that someone should be jointly all right, the other thing that you have to sort of figure out on termination of marriage is alimony and child support, spousal support and child support, right? Uh, again, statistically, alimony is on the decline, right? Because we no longer live in, quote unquote, of 1950s America, right? It's not the traditional family where only one spouse supports it. Right? So alimony used to be very, very common when you had a working spouse and a homemaker spouse. Not so much, right? I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, the notion of paying someone monthly support after marriage is still possible in the right situation, but to the extent that it is, it's typically a temporary sort of a thing where, you know, you're not going to have it well for the rest of your life. You're going to be paying $1,000 to your spouse. It just isn't typical because it's just not the kind of society you live in. I mean, it's still possible, to, you know, but it's not as typical. Um, so usually, um, uh, 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 you know, it's temporary or re rehabilitation, meaning until the other spouse sort of gets back on their feet. The notion of permanent or lifetime alimony, which used to be until the other spouse dies or remarries, uh, isn't all that typical. But what still remains typical is child support, right? I mean, you have minor children, and you're getting a divorce, and one party's going to have physical custody, maybe joint physical custody, but physical custody, then the other spouse is expected uh, to contribute. Remember, we said parents, parents are responsible for minors' needs, and just because the parents choose to no longer be together doesn't mean that one of them gets a free pass, or either of them get a free pass from supporting their children. For how long? Age of majority, right? 
uh, until the child typically graduates from high school or voluntarily chooses to live on their own. So it's for, you know, it could be for a uh, uh, you know, relatively long period of time. How much? Depends on the circumstances, right? Depends, again, on you know, where you're living, who's living, what are the needs, so on and so forth, right? And there's a lot of going, you know, a divorce could be granted, but people keep going back to family court oftentimes on child support. Just increase it, decrease it, you know, back and forth, back and forth. This goes on. This keeps family courts in this country pretty busy. Um, the other thing that uh, was a problem, and, you know, I sort of brought this up with, um, when we were talking about, you know, you win a lawsuit, you win a breach of contract lawsuit, and the court awards you uh, $50,000 in damages. Yay, how are you gonna collect on it, right? And that was always a problem, because just because you have a piece of paper that says you're entitled to the money, if the other party doesn't wanna pay you, they're not paying you. Now you have to go back to court and make them give you the money. And that's what's happening with child support. You know, one parent has to pay child support, but they're not paying it. You know, you wait, the other parent is waiting, and blah, blah, blah. So in 1994, the Family Support Act was passed, which basically said that there can be automatic wage withholding, garnishment, um, from the, you know, if one parent has to pay child support. And what that could mean in the right set of circumstances is that uh, that parent is employed, then that portion that they have to pay will be automatically deducted from their paycheck and sent to um, you know, the other spouse or the child whose benefit is to be support. So, you know, again, it frees up the family court to have to go, well, I didn't get paid last month, and so on and so forth. If you just, you know, if the court says you have to get paid, well, then withholding is the way that it's typically uh, gonna go. Well, who, which parent does, um, you know, does custody go to? Um, again, something that could be worked out in a settlement agreement, but if not, then the family courts have to get involved. And the sort of the the test for this is you've heard this all time and time again: best interest of the child. You know, I mean that's kind of tough uh, because you're having uh, some neutral third party decide this on your behalf if you can't decide this on your own. Um, you know, most people would say joint custody, maybe one party will get physical custody, maybe, you know, they'll share on the weekend, or whatever the case might be, but if there's some real issues, imagine if there's a substance abuse problem, imagine if there's depression issues, and all of those things, sometimes you have psychologists involved, you have, you know, I mean, it becomes uh, somewhat complicated. Um, but, you know, uh, oftentimes you have a custodial parent, meaning the parent that is awarded physical uh, custody of the child or legal custody, or it could be a joint custody situation where, you know, again, nothing wrong with either parent's parental parenting skills. It's just a matter of, um, you know, uh, may make sense if one party wants to move to another state or something that the children remain in New Jersey and continue with school. So one parent will just get physical custody and the other parent will just provide child support. So all of these arrangements are possible uh, to the extent that a parent does not get custody, physical custody or otherwise. Um, the law would say that if there's no uh, safety issue, then at least uh, there should be visitation rights, right? Uh, maybe they're court supervised, again, depending on the situation, but best interest of the child often mean that you don't have a child go through a divorce and live through the trauma of that and also be separated from seeing the other parent. So the courts will try the best that they can to make a bad situation workable, and they'll revisit this, right? So not only is it uh, child support, but sometimes custody issues through going back and forth to the courts to revisit all of that.